Today we are looking at Joshua chapter 5. Beautiful portion of scripture. Um, and you know who we're going to see in this chapter? We're actually going to see Jesus. And I think that's just a wonderful thing when you think about it. But we're also going to see some things that point out um, just our point of, of, of gaining um, new ways of victory, philosophies and mindsets that we should have as children of God. The Lord Jesus always tells us not to worry, not to have anxiety, not to fear, um, but only believe. Now, we don't do that all the time. All right, we get up, we get upset, we get worried, we get scared, we get frustrated, we get angry. A lot of times because we believe in a lie that's not really true, uh, but it seems to be true, and that is that some somehow or another God's not going to bring us through it, or we're going to have some kind of disaster that we can't handle, and that's not true. All right, uh, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go forth. But uh, let's go ahead and get the reading in, and. Uh, Take a listen to this wonderful portion of, of scripture. Joshua chapter 5. Let's take a listen. Chapter 5. And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites which were on the side of Jordan westward and all the kings of the Canaanites which were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over that their heart melted neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives, and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way, after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness, till all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord sware that he would not shew them the land to which the Lord sware unto their fathers that he would give us, a land that floweth with milk and honey. Their children whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you, wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal, and kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes, and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land, neither had the children of Israel manna any more. But they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him, with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him, and said unto him, Art thou for us, or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and did worship, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot. For the place where thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. All right. We've heard that saying before, didn't we? Oh, Moses. All right. Mm -hmm. And we saw that with Moses, right? When he was at the burning bush. And so what you're seeing is that fire that Moses saw was a representation of the what? The very presence of God. Um, and so what we see here with this captain of the Lord's army, that once again, we see a very present uh, uh uh, uh, representation of the of, of God himself but he comes in this human form which I will um, describe and say is a pre-incarnate uh, experience of the Lord Jesus that Joshua experienced and that's why Jesus could say before Moses was I, I, I am uh, he was before um, 
uh, he was in the Old Testament. He was uh, the one that met um, Abraham as well. We saw another occasion when that happened. And so we see these from time to time. But we also know that Jesus said, Father, give me the body that was prepared for, uh, for me before the what? Foundations of the earth. So we know that uh, his, his existence is the existence of an eternal God. And he already always knew that he was going to need to redeem man. And that's one thing sometimes we should always keep in mind. We often can sometimes think <clears throat> that this was a big old problem and a mistake that God uh, had to deal with. And that's not the case. God recognizes all that needs to be done. There was no, well, I hope Adam and Eve do well when they were in the garden. God already knew. He already, because see, he doesn't learn anything new. So he wasn't surprised. He wasn't surprised by what Satan did. God is never taken off guard, and we have to keep that in mind. And sometimes it's hard for us to compliment to, to contemplate and think about how could God see all of this and allow it to be? Well, once you ask that question, you find out that you don't know the answer to it. Why? Because that's God's uh, level thinking. That's where he is. That's why Satan was thinking he could do something, but God was already what? Way ahead of him. I know where you're going. Right? And we know this, and even Jesus um, showcase this a lot of times when he would tell tell people about things that they were going to be doing. He told Peter, before Peter denied him, you're going to deny me twice. Right? And he said, uh, and, I, and the sign that it will help you remember what I told you is you're going to hear this rooster crow three times. And by the time that rooster crowed three times, you will have denied me uh, 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 several times. And so it's important for us to recognize the, um, the eternal aspect of God. And so when we see Jesus appearing here in the Old Testament, it's just a beautiful concept of realizing the eternal God that we serve. Now, let's take a look at this. What we already know, this chapter starts with the word and. And I always try to tell you when you, when you see a chapter start with the word and, make sure that you pull the, the other stuff into it so that you get the context of what's, what's being implied here. And so we know that what's happening previously was that Joshua is made uh, leader after the death of Moses. We also know that Joshua was given instructions on how to maneuver them from the, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, west side of the Jordan River over to the east side. All right? And so uh, they've been given instructions to go from the, uh, the wilderness into the promised land. There was a dividing of the Jordan River, all right? similar to that, what happened in the Red Sea. Uh, they were told to get stones out of the bottom of that river and make a monument, a memorial, to, to solidify this is what God has done. Now, with all that going on, look at what verse 1 starts off and says. Look at what happens here. It says, and it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites were, which were on the side of Jordan westward and all the kings of the Canaanites which were uh, by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan for before the children of Israel until they passed over that their hearts melted neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. Now, we got to pause there and think about this. Do you remember the first time when the children of Israel came to, to uh, this portion of scripture? I mean, I mean, this portion of the land. And they went in and spied out the land. And they looked at the, the, the Canaanites and the Amorites and all the giants. And what happened? Their hearts melted. Israel's hearts, those, those uh, spies, eight of those ten spies were like, oh, we can't, we can't get, get this. We can't defeat these people because they are giants. And they were comparing the giants to their statue and said, we are like grasshoppers in their midst. And so their hearts melt. Well, fast forward. 
those all those people died, which we're going to see here in a minute because this, this chapter talks about that. And now when they get to this point and this time they obey God, then what they begin to do is they watch God do things that will make the enemy's heart melt. Now the enemy is like, wow, they're doing things way more uh, astonishing than, than what we are capable of doing or understanding. And so they begin to recognize that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that can do all things, the God that defeated all the, the false gods of Egypt, is with them. And it says, and their, their, their hearts dried up, their hearts melted, and they recognized that they could no longer deal with the fact that uh, uh, we are going to rely on our strength to defeat these people because these people have a God that has defeated every God, every false God, and has also brought them through the Jordan River, not during the dry season, brought them through the Jordan River during the flood season, but was able to separate the waters. And it says their hearts melted. Now that's a very good um, um, illustration to us oftentimes we try to think about, you know, what can we do in the realm of the spirit? If we just believe God and let God work the miracles in our life, the enemies that come up against us will, will have a fear of antagonizing us. They don't want to deal with it. There's certain people that it, the devil knows if I mess with this individual, all it's going to do is make my situation worse. And the scriptures all, uh, said that there's many mysteries in God, and because God has things that are deeper than what even Satan, Lucifer, the, you know, uh, the devil can even comprehend, Paul said, if the devil would have known what would happen uh, after the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, that, that he would not have done it. But guess what? It shows the ignorance of, of our enemy. And so what happens is our enemy will do something, stir up something, and then God will come in and show his mighty hand. God is with this person. So what do we need to, to pull from this? We need to make sure that when we're facing our enemies, we're, we're doing it with the authority of God. We can't fight enemies on our own. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers in dark places. And, in, uh, and, and, and so we can't fight them with, with our own knives and guns and, 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 and attitudes. And, and you can't cuss out the devil and think he's going to run away. You can't do any of that stuff. you got to come to him with the leading of the Lord in spiritual warfare. Yes, sir. You know, uh, you said something that really... I was working this week with... Um, for this guy painting his house inside. And he hired these men to come and do some other work. And I said to one of the men, I said, sir, um, he, he, he said, there's no water here. I said, yeah, there's water in the kitchen. You walk and get it. I said, and you could go out on the deck and it'll be closer to your job. And I said, are you gonna stir up a lot of dust because I'm down here painting this door? To make a long story short, this guy, I could see the enemy in. He said, <clears throat> he go, uh, 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 I, I, I'm going to leave my machine right here. I said, okay, sir, no problem. So he goes upstairs, he looks around, he comes back and goes, oh, you know, if you were right, the deck is right next to the room where we're working at, and we could have did it there. I said, yes, yeah, sir, I had to wait till you settle down a little bit. I said, <laughs> I almost said the enemy would say, but I said, I said, wait till you calm down. But I could see the enemy in him. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing, well, make a long story short, next thing you know, I was witnessing to him, telling him about Jesus. He mm -hmm. said, my grandfather, he, he, he was a minister. I said, well, that's good. <laughs> right? yep. But you have to watch the enemy. Mm -hmm. He's so sick and cunning yep. that you have to ask for wisdom. And I do that constantly with working and I said, Lord, give me wisdom, things mm -hmm. to say, things not to say. 
right? Because when, when the Lord shows himself, the enemy's heart will melt. And sometimes that's a, a opportunity for you to talk to that individual that has the enemy in them. And, um, and we always got to keep in mind, and it don't always got to be a person that ain't saved, because sometimes the enemy can get in us too. And we got to make sure that we are praying and say, Lord, I don't want to use the, uh, the information that the enemy is putting in my mind to, and go forth and act on it. Um, and, and we do it <laughs> probably more times than we realize. Uh, but it's an important thing to recognize. Randy, but the guy started telling me about he need to go to AA. He, 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 then he started jumping all of this. Mm. And I told him, I said, you know what? I said, the brother, the Lord loves you. And I said, the devil, I said, what he does, we're like bowling pins. We're all sitting up and he has a ball. He's trying to knock down as many as he can. Mm -hmm. And he said, there, you know, he said, Dad, because he was cursing a lot too. And then he, now when he cursed, he said, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. it's just the thing that if we just let God, instead of we try to fix it or do it, we'll be all right. That's right, that's right. And if you remember that, uh, hello, Beverly, good to see you. If you remember that, um, even Rahab, remember, we went through that story. She already recognized. She's like, I know that y'all going to get the victory. And so now, even now, the kings are seeing this. Uh, we're uh, in Joshua chapter 5. And so, um, so now their hearts melt. We see that in, uh, in, uh, at the end of verse 1. Look at verse 2. And it says, At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, who said this? The Lord. Make sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel a second time. All right. Now, let's pause there for a second. Jesus told a story about um, a tree that bring forth no fruit. And that tree, he said that eventually he will do what? Cut it down. But then he said, the tree that brings forth fruit, what does he do with that tree? Did he say he's going to leave it alone and let it just keep bringing forth fruit? No. He says he's going to do what? Prune it. Why? That it may bring forth more fruit. And when you prune something, when you prune a tree, what are you doing? You're cutting away all the, the, the wild sap, saplings that don't really produce. You're cutting away all the dead portions. And you, you're basically using some kind of pruning knife or some kind of clippers to cut it. And so when I see this aspect about the sharp knives, because they're coming into the place of God's promised blessing, and God is now going to prune them. Now, what is this pruning? What is this circumcision? This, this, this circumcision is the cutting away of the foreskin on the male penis. Now, what does that represent? It represents removing the what? The flesh. So, when you come into the things of God, I don't want you to be led by your flesh. I want you to be led by the Spirit. And it's symbolized by the cutting away of the flesh of the, the foreskin. Now, you say, well, wait a minute. Didn't they already do this? I kind of remember Israel uh, being uh, circumcised previously. Well, Let's go back to the story and let's have our, our, uh, our, the Spirit of God through the Word of God inform us as to why this is happening a second time. All right? So look at verse 3. <clears throat> and Joshua made him sharp knives. He's going to get some knives. And what kind of knives is it? Sharp. What is also the Word of God described as? A sword. A sharp sword. Sharp enough to, to cut between the what? The bone, the marrow, and the soul, and the spirit. Mm -hmm. All right. The word of God is described as a sword. All right. He made sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskin. Okay. That speaks about what we talked about. Look at verse 4. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. Okay. Now we're going to get the information as to why it has to happen a second time. And he says, all the people that came out of Egypt. All the people that came out of Egypt, Egypt is a representation of what? Sin. sin. All the people that came out of Egypt or came out of sin that were males. 
Why is it males? Because the male is the one that is being forced, that's being circumcised. All right. Even all the men of war died in the wilderness, by the way, after they came out of Egypt. They came out of sin, but died in the wilderness. All right? And that wilderness represents the carnality. So even though they were circumcised, the flesh was removed in Egypt, they still were following the flesh when they were in the wilderness. And that's why they still died. So symbolically, we can do a lot of things. All right? You can say, well, I'm going to pray for this and I pray over my food. But are you really praying that God takes that food and makes it healthy for your body? Are you really believing that God can take away impurities? Or are you just saying, well, this is just part of what we do? Why are you going, why do you come onto a Zoom or go to a church? I'm going just to see what people are doing. Or are you really trying to get to know who God is? Am I going there to see God? Or am I going to show off a new dress or a new suit or meet somebody or see who's there or see who's not there? What's your purpose? Why are you even spending time with the things of God? You're in, the, in this wilderness where you can actually grow and build your faith. That's why God brings you through that. But if you go in there and you don't develop, you will die in the wilderness. Okay? So it says all the men are a war, and they were supposed to be warriors, but they died in the wilderness. Look, uh, They came out of Egypt. Look at verse 5. Now, all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. So the children that were born in the wilderness, these are the ones that are going now into the, uh, the land of milk and honey. They're crossed, those, these are the ones that crossed the Jordan. They had not been circumcised. Look at verse 6. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were circumcised because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Remember? God said, we're going to go over and we're going to conquer this land. And they said, no, we can't go conquer it because they were giants. I can't overemphasize the, um, just the problem that we can have by making a problem bigger than God. All of us have problems. Every one of us has things that we got to deal with that's difficult, hard, unfortunate things that we don't want. And if we ever get to the point where we continuously make our problem bigger than God, now what are we serving? What are we bending down to? We're bending down to the problem. And the problem will bring out in us the things that problems do. Because those problems emphasize and reiterate the nature of the enemy. So it will bring out envy. Why has why this happened to me and didn't happen to that guy? It will bring out Hatred. I can't stand that I have to, I hate what I'm doing or what I'm living or how I'm doing or, or, you know, it'll bring out all of these things in us. It will not bring out any of the fruit of the spirit. It will only bring out the fruit of the flesh. This is why symbolically we're supposed to cut off the flesh. We got to circumcise that nature in us. Amen. So that we can continuously look at our problems and still go, well, God is bigger than my problem. Amen. I got a problem. Amen. I'm not denying it and I'm not ignoring it. I'm not saying I don't have an issue, but I do have a God that's bigger <coughs> than the Jesus. problem I have. Thank you, Jesus. So therefore, I am going to walk as a circumcised individual. I'm not going to be led by the foreskin of, of my oh, penis. Yes. I'm not going to allow that to happen. Thank you. Now, ain't that something that a lot of men in the world need to hear? Because mm-hmm. a lot of people, you know, they, they think with the wrong, with the wrong brain. <laughs> and all, they're, try, all mm-hmm. they're trying to do is satisfy the flesh. Mm-hmm. And if you're living like that, then you're not going to ever be satisfied. One of the things that I can guarantee you is that God, if you lean and trust on him, he will give you the things that you desire. He will give you the desires of your heart. You will have all of the joy that you think you're going to get by following the flesh 
you're not, mm -hmm. it's only going to be temporal and it's going to it's not going to be long lasting. But God can give you that joy and greater mm -hmm. if you follow him. Right? Amen. And so that's the the important concept that we need to make sure that we have. So for this cause, finishing up verse six, it says, because they obeyed not the, ver the voice of the Lord uh, unto whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land. You're not going to see the, the land of what? Milk and honey. Milk and honey. Your existence in your walk will be a walk of wilderness walk. Right? Always wandering, never having a homeland. Which the Lord swore unto their fathers, and he would uh, give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. There it is again. There's the promise. So we want to flow with the milk and honey of the Lord in our relationship. That represents that milk and honey represents our connection to God. And when you come into this land, guess who you're going to meet? You, you're going to meet Jesus. And that's what Joshua, we're going to get to that in a minute. Joshua, going to meet, he's going to meet Jesus in just a bit. Verse 7. And their children, whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised. These are the ones he so he symbolically again letting them know I'm cutting away the flesh. Why? Because it symbolizes how we are. We are not going to be people that are going to be led by the flesh. We're going to be led by the spirit. Right? For they were uncircumcised because they were not circumcised. They did not circumcise them by the way. Verse eight. And it came to pass when they had done circumcised all the people that they abode in their place in the camp until they were whole. Now, what does this speak of? Cutting away the flesh is not something you just do and just hop out and skip around and do go, go about your, your day. You know, when you cut away the flesh, guess what you're going to do? You're going to have withdrawal. Mm -hmm. You're going to have some issues because you still are going to crave the things that you want. So you sometimes need to just stop and just allow the, the power of God to heal you. Because mm -hmm. that circumcision now needs time to do what? To heal. And when you have come to the Lord, sometimes you just got to stop. Some people say, well, when I give my heart to the Lord Jesus, I want to run and do all this kind of stuff. I want to go minister to... Minister to who? About what? <laughs> what have you overcome? What have you been uh, delivered from? Sit down, relax, and allow the healing to take place. It's beautiful that you agreed to allow God to cut away some of your fleshly appetites. But now that you have gotten that cleaned out, you now have to learn how to develop the things of God. Remember Jesus told the story about the woman that, that uh, went in her room uh, her, and, and herself and they cast out all the devils out of her. She was clean and swept and was clean. And then, but the thing was that she didn't put what? The things of God in her. So when the devil that was cast out went around and noticed that the person that she came, that the devil came out of still had an empty room, said, I'm going to go back into that same person and I'm going to bring other devils with me. And it says the end state of that individual was worse than the first. Why? Because you didn't take time to fill what you emptied. When you take out the flesh, you, you're not removing the flesh just so you can be empty. You want to fill it with the Spirit. Spirit, amen. Therefore, now you can now have a different appetite. I got an appetite to satisfy God, not an appetite to satisfy my own personal lust. Amen. Okay. So Amen. until Amen. Uh, until they were made whole, they had to sit down and get whole. Right? Allow God to to to, to bring your spirit to a place where it can actually uh, develop. Mm -hmm. Verse nine, and the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of that place was called Gilgad unto this day. Now what does this mean? I have removed the reproach, the, the stigma of living in sin, which is Egypt, I have removed that from you. 
right? Because see, while you're in the wilderness, you still have the effect of once being in, in Egypt. Why? Because I, I was living in Egypt, and now I'm going to, I'm in the wilderness. I'm not living, I'm wandering. But now when I come into Jordan, I'm coming here to live. This is, the, this is going to be my dwelling place. I was living in sin, but now I'm going to live in Jesus. Amen. All right? And so, but, and I'm not going to wander. Because see, when you're wandering, remember when they were wandering, how they were heading towards the land of milk and honey, but they kept looking back and going, I wish we were back in Egypt. Egypt. They're still yeah. lusting for the things of, uh, of the sinful lifestyle while they were trying to walk their way to the land of milk and honey. Walking forward and looking backwards. Who did that? Lot's wife, remember? She's walking out of, out, out of Sodom and Gomorrah, but looking back. And what happened? She died right there. How? Why? Because God turned her into a pillar. So you never get to the destination. So there are a lot of people. Remember Jesus gave the story of the sower that went forth to sow seed? Some fell by the wayside and never grew. But some fell um, in stony places, and it grew a little bit, but as soon as the heat came, as soon as some kind of pressure, it withered and died. Some of it did grow and grew for a little while, and it grew in the midst of thorns and thistles. And so it grew, but eventually, the thorns and the thistles did what? It okay. choked it out. So it did not bring forth. So it grew, but it never brought forth fruit. So there were a lot of people that have these stages, but they never actually get the milk and the honey. It never gets to them. They came out, but they didn't get. And so we got to make sure that we get to that point uh, where we can now say we are in Gilgad. We have, we have removed the full reproach of sin. I'm now not out of sin, but looking back and longing for it. I'm out of sin and in the Lord Jesus and thankful and don't want any of what the Lord has taken me out of to come back into my hungers or my desires or my thirsts. I only hunger and thirst for the word of God. And we're going we're gonna to see that here in a minute. All right, look at verse 10. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgad. All right, they're encamped in that place where now they have no more reproach of sin, of Egypt. And kept the Passover. Now, that's another sign. They kept, they did the Passover. The Passover, the first Passover was happened where? In Egypt, which was a sign of them coming out of sin. I'm going to remove you from the power of sin. Now, all you got to do is want the things of God. I removed the power of sin. I cleaned you out. You are empty from all of that. Now you just got to continuously fill your spirit with me. All right, that was that first Passover. And that Passover will allow you to not suffer the wages of sin. The wages of sin is what? Death. And in that first pass Passover, what came? The death angel. But death passed over them because they had blood on the doorposts. So now they're celebrating in Gilgad the, the, another Passover. All right? Uh, on the 14th day of the month, uh, at evening in the plains of Jericho. So that they're doing this uh, right on the outskirts of Jericho, which we're going to see a lot of going forward. All right? Because Jericho is going to be one of those major, major battles. They're going to look like there's no way we can defeat this. Just like some of the things we deal with in our life. I see no way to get this thing defeated. But God has an answer. And we're going to see that uh, a little later on. Look at verse 11. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. So after the Passover, they went into the land that they were in, and it already had what there? Corn. corn. Wait a minute. How come this, they didn't plant this corn? How come they, they got land where corn's already there? Well, what's the description of the land? A land of what? Milk and honey. It's got food. It, it, you're going to be all right because the provisions of it. All right. But now look at how this old corn is, uh, is kind of compared with. Let's keep reading. Uh, they ate up the old corn after the Passover, unleavened cakes, 
and parts corn in the self same day. Now, look at verse 12. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel uh, manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of the Canaanite that year. Look at that. So God told you, I'm going to bring you into a land of milk and honey. This land will already have for you laid out what you will need. When you were in the wilderness, that's not the place of, of milk and honey. So God, in order for you to even be sustained in the wilderness, you've got to be nurtured by God like a baby that has to suck on the mom. Because you can't go and do it yourself. And God has to keep holding you and you'll continue to be a babe. Now, what did Paul say? He said, when you were a babe, you could only take the what? The milk. Yeah. But as you grow, you can learn to eat the solid food. The solid. And so in the wilderness, you had to keep being uh, nurtured and nourished by the manna, which represents God has to keep on giving you something directly from him, drop it on the ground, you go pick it up, and, you know, and so, and, and he couldn't wean you off of that until you got developed enough to where you had the faith to go into this land where these giants are, go into this place, cross the, the Jordan River, and you develop a maturity, get circumcised, all right, and all, and now you're ready to do what? Eat of the old corn. Now, what does the old corn represent when we eat it? We're eating from the land of milk and honey. What are we eating from? We're eating from the Lord Jesus. We're eating from the word of God. Because the word of God is what feeds us. And when we eat the word of God, what are we, what are we receiving to ourselves? In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And the word was made flesh. And dwelt among us. So when you're eating of that old corn, you're eating of that word, you're eating of Jesus. And that's what we're doing right now. We're sitting here just eating old corn mm. from the Amen. Old Testament. Amen. Just receiving from God. Thank you, Jesus. And God says, yeah, if you do this, you will be blessed. You will be nourished. Mm -hmm. All right? And you will find yourself developing and you will find yourself growing. But if you don't, uh, if you're going to keep looking for a situation where I'm looking for God to drop down some manna. No. He said, you have, you have been weaned off. You can now find God all you want. Where? In the land. In the old corn. Because you're now in the land of milk and honey. That means we're in the Lord. We're in Jesus. Jesus said, if you be in me and I be in you, you shall ask what you will. So, Thank be to God, we're in the land of milk and honey, uh, which is a representation of being in God, in Jesus. <clears throat> All right? Um, and so that whole thing of being uh, fortified in Jesus, while you're in the place where the Amorites and the Canaanites are. So we're in Jesus where? In this world, where the Symbolism of the Ananites and Canaanites, which represents the spirit and nature of Satan. That's where, because those were the, the, the individuals that were following these false uh, satanic rituals, and now God's people are in that land. But God is sustaining them. The land will sustain you, but I will be your God. And that's what we do here. We sustained in this world. We have to find out how to work from a political standpoint, from jobs, from health care, all that stuff. But God says, I'm the one that's going to carry you through this land. Yes, you got a job, but don't think it's the job that's carrying you. Amen. Yes, you got health care, but don't think it's the health care that's keeping you. Mm -hmm. You got all this stuff. You got, yes, you got a bank account, but don't think it's your bank account that's going to make you be able to mm -hmm. make it through tomorrow. That's right. See that stuff, that's part of the land, but it's because of me. So use that old corn and eat of it, but recognize that I'm the one that blessed you. Yes, 
Right. Use the word of God. Amen. Mm-hmm. Verse 13. Mm-hmm. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho. He's over there by the place where he's going to have to fight. Sometimes God will put you right by your enemy. Sometimes your enemy will be right next to you. And you got to just be like, okay, I'm going to wait here until God says, deal with him. Sometimes, sometimes you just got to live with the enemy until God says, all right, I'm about time, about time to take the enemy down. But you got to wait on God. Amen. Jericho is going to fall, but not until God tells it and says it. And God's going to give you in complete instructions on how to do it. So Joshua was, well, Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes. He did what with his eyes? He lifted up. All right? He's looking up. He lifted up his eyes and looked. All right? So we got we to gotta be looking. We got to be looking. And when we look, we're looking up. I'm looking to who? To God. And behold, there stood a man. All right? So when he looked, <coughs> excuse me. The first thing he saw, I see a man. Okay? A lot of people, when they see Jesus, that's all they see. He's just a man, just like anybody else. There are a lot of historians and a lot of people that do a lot of biblical study, and they say, well, Jesus was just a man just like everybody else. And that's what the religious leaders of Jesus' day said. You being a man, make yourself equal to God. And that's why they wanted to stone him. All right? So he saw a man over against him with a sword drawn. So here's a man with a sword. Jesus has a sword. And when we saw him described in the book of Revelation, we saw him as having eyes as a flame and fire and swords coming out of his mouth. Right? So he has his sword drawn in his hand. And the word of God is often described as a two-edged sword. Right? Discerning between the, 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 the soul and the spirit, the body and the, the marrow and, uh, and, the, and the bone. He's got a sword in his hand. And Joshua went unto him. Okay, important. Joshua didn't run away. Joshua didn't ignore him. Joshua didn't just turn his back. He saw it and he went unto him. That's what we got to do. Make sure that we always, when we see the, 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 the representation of God, we walk towards that. Amen. Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversary? He didn't understand who this was. And so he wanted, he, he see, this is a man that's ready to fight. But he's fighting a different kind of battle. Joshua's fighting a battle in the natural, but he's, he's fighting a battle in the spiritual. But Joshua doesn't get it right now. And he says, I want to know, whose side are you on? Now, you would think, that the man would say, oh, well, I'm on your side. But he doesn't say that. All right? Look at what, look at what uh, he says. Uh, it says in verse 14, and he said, nay. So I'm not answering your question with a yes or a no or your side or my side. Your question is not valid. Because it's not whose side am I on. The question is, whose side are you on? Because <laughs> he said, but as a captain... Of the host of the Lord am I come. Mm. So he said, I am God. I'm the captain of the host of God. And so the question should not be whose side am I on? Mm-hmm. The question should be whose side are you on? Yes. So are you gonna fight with me? Because I'm gonna fight against the enemy. I'm gonna fight against the the, 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 the devil, Satan, Lucifer, the old dragon. God, Jesus is going to continuously fight him because he has risen up. And this is, once again, all in the plan of God. God's not trying to fix something that, that was a mistake. This is all part of what God has already outlined. Nothing is new. You say, well, then why do we got to go through this? A lot of times uh, uh, when you look at things, you come up with, at least I do, with two answers. First answer is, I don't know. And I don't mind telling you I don't know. But the second answer I got, I do know one thing. God knows me. But what he wants me to do is he wants me to know me. And sometimes we refuse 
to see ourselves yeah. as God, God sees. sees us. That's right. And God's trying to say, you're either going to make it in or you're not going to make it in. Mm -hmm. But I need you to look in the mirror to see why. Mm -hmm. Right? God already knows who's going in and who's not going in. We don't know. From our perspective, we don't know who's saved, who's, who's lost, who's, who's in the Lord and going backslide. We use terms like backsliding. From God's perspective, there is no backsliding. There was no, oop, God says, oop, I think you're in. Oop, looks like you're not in. God's not confused. Mm -hmm. He already knows. So from his perspective, he just needs you to understand why. I need you to, to get a clear understanding as to why you made it or you didn't make it. Because from God's perspective, it's already happened. But you, we are confused as to why. So then that's why he says, now, well, how do I know whether I made it or not? Well, the Lord said, come unto me, all ye that labor, all right, uh, uh, and a heavy burden, and I will take care of you. Mm -hmm. I will no wise what? Cast you out. If you come unto me, I will not cast you away. If you come into the hand of the Lord, the scripture says that, I, Paul said, I'm persuaded that nothing can separate me from the love of God. So if you want to make sure, and you go, well, wait, wait a minute. How do I make sure if God already knows? Don't try to get into the, God of, the, the mind of God. Don't try to figure that out. Because all you're going to do is get confused. Do what God said to do. Then you can be assured that, that you are part of the ones that are going to find out why I made it. You don't want to find out why I didn't make it. So you got to make sure that you are on the side of the Lord. You got to be on his side. But you got to make sure that you choose that. All right, so he's not, he said, no, because God says, the, the scripture says, for God so loved the what? The world. That even means those Canaanites and those Amorites. But God gave them opportunity, Remember? He told Abraham, I can't bring your people in here now because the iniquity of the Canaanites is not full. I'm still giving them time to develop. And you go, well, now God says they're not going to make it. Well, yeah, that's true. As a people, they didn't make it. But there were individuals here that did make it. Rahab is an example. Rahab is a Canaanite. It's in the land where God is coming to take over. But she didn't die. Why? Because she believed. So were there individuals that were in this land that were able to escape the torment? Yes, there are. We will see there were multiple people that were, were not Israelites, but will believe in the Israelite God and be able to make it. So whose side is God on? God, he said in verse 14, but he said, nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord, am I come? That's why I'm here. I'm fighting the battle. And if you want to win, you better get on my side. I'm the winning captain. I'm the one that's going to win the battle. And so what does Joshua do? Well, let's take a look. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth. I think Joshua joined his side. <laughs> he fell on his face to the earth and did what? Worship. Worship. He's like, yep. I'm, 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 I'm going to get on your side. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to see you as who? As God. Because the Bible tells us that the Lord God we should worship, and we should not worship what? No other God. Mm -hmm. So the moment Joshua falls on his face and worships this captain of the Lord of hosts, we then know this is God incarnate. This is a representation of God. Because he allowed, because there were many times we saw in Revelation when John saw angels and he fell down just like Joshua did and began to worship. But what did the angel do? Get up. Don't worship me. I'm a fellow servant like you. Worship God. Yeah. But this captain, he continued to allow and then added some more to that. Look at what he says. He worshiped and, and, and said unto him, What saith my Lord? What does he call him? My Lord. Lord. My, Lord. my Lord. Unto his servant. He sees himself as a what? 
as a servant. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. This is Joshua, the captain of, of, of the armies of God, of, of, of the armies of Israel. And he's saying, what? I'm a servant. Goes back to once again. That's how we should be. They that would be great must learn how to do what? Serve. Serve. Service. All right? And we've, we've, we've kind of lost that concept. All right? Our final uh, verse here. Look at verse uh, 15. It says, and the, cap and, it says and the captain of the Lord, Lord's host said unto Joshua. Now, he's speaking unto Joshua. Look what he says to him. Loose thy shoes from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. So, what is he saying here? You're standing in the very presence of God. All the things that you did, that little Passover uh, celebration that you had, that crossing of the Jordan, all of those are ritual rites that will allow you to be in the presence of God and not be consumed. If you're not doing the things of God, if you come before God with spot, blemish, or wrinkle, what happens to you? You are consumed. But if you come to him proper, covered with the, with the righteousness of Christ, you then can be in his very presence. This is all ceremonial, ritual uh, uh, rites that go forth that allow individuals in the Old Testament, just like Moses uh, and now Joshua, to be in the very presence. And then God even told them, I'm going to create something for you. He called it the, the tabernacle. And when you make this tabernacle, you're going to make it with the outer court and the inner court and the holy place and the holy holy, holy of holies. And my presence will be there. But don't just walk up nilly-willy into the holy of holies. Because if you do that, what's going to happen? You will drop down dead. You will be consumed. So there are procedural aspects. And each one of those procedural aspects represents some action that Jesus does to purchase our redemption. And so when you go through that, you will find yourself where? In the very presence of God. So what were some of the actions? Let's review. They believe God. They crossed over the Jordan. They got circumcised. They removed the flesh. They celebrated the Passover. And then guess who shows up? Jesus. Why are you doing that? I'm doing that because it's part of the ritual. Now, thanks be to God, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection now has satisfied all those uh, ceremonial activities that the uh, people in the Old Testament had to do in order to be in the very presence of God. And we can see that because at the time of Jesus' death, the barrier to the Holy of Holies was what? Ripped in two. And the scripture now tells us we can go to the Lord God boldly. We can come to his throne boldly. But the beauty of it is that God has always made a way for people to be in his presence. You have to go through the very symbolic aspects of what Jesus did, Old Testament, or you gotta accept and receive what Jesus did, New Testament or New Covenant. But either way, you gotta accept the work of Christ, either in its foreshadowing or in its actuality. And when you do that, you can then be in the presence of the captain of the Lord of hosts. That's the beauty. And so even with us now, we can be in the presence of God right now, right where you are. Jesus said, I'm with you always. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And sometimes we don't even recognize it. That's why I style our name Emmaus because on the Emmaus road, those two individuals were walking and they were just traveling. Had the presence of God, God was walking with them. Jesus the resurrected Jesus was walking with them, and they didn't recognize it. But the beauty of it is, even though you didn't recognize it, he was still walking with you. 
And that's the thing that sometimes we need to recognize. Every day we get up, the Lord is right there. He get up, he's right there looking at you. When you go to bed, he's right there looking at you. He's there. Why? Because he said, I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. I will be with you always. So sometimes it's hard for us to comprehend just the very presence of God all the time, everywhere, without ceasing. And if you ever just try to absorb that, you, you recognize, I'm not alone. I'm not suffering or going through or dealing with anything by myself. God is here. But can I open my eyes, open my spirit, open my mind to just believe that even though I don't see it with my natural eyes, can I believe it by faith? Can I accept it in my spiritual person? That God is with me. I don't need to be frustrated. I don't need to be fearful. I don't need to have anxiety. God, now, I'm saying all that, realizing that just like Jesus told his disciples not to fear, everything's going to be fine. When he got arrested, what did they all do? They all ran away. They all scattered. Smite, the scripture says, smite the shepherd, and the sheep will what? Scatter. And that's what we do. We scatter a lot of times. We get Because we get scatterbrained. <laughs> we ain't thinking about how good God is and how he's with us. And even though we're going through, he's working the problems out in our lives eternally through the problems we deal with. And for us to accept that and to learn, if we can, how to be in the storm. Remember when Jesus was in the storm on the boat? The disciples would look like, what is going on? And Jesus was on the end part of the boat. What was he doing? Yes. Sleeping. Jesus slept through the storm. Amen. But the disciples, all they had through the storm was worry, anxiety, and like, do you not care that we're going to perish? And Jesus said, where's your faith? And then he just woke up and said, peace be what? Be still. So, you know, these are things to help us and to encourage us. That God's with you. He's going to carry you through. Now, I'm not trying to say you are not in a storm. I'm not trying to say that the boat's not going back and forth. I'm not trying to say that water's coming in and splashing you in the face. All that's happening. Life brings real problems. But Jesus is on board. Amen. And that's what you need to lean on. Uh, you got to find a way to lean on that and then find out what the Lord of hosts would have you do while you're in the problem. While you're worshiping him. While you're worshiping him. You bow down to him, worship him, and allow him to show you how to handle your problems that you will deal with. Because we will deal with them here. God uses them for whatever reasons he sees fit, but it's always for your ultimate benefit and your ultimate good. All right. I'm going to stop, not because I can't say anything else, but because I just have to stop because <laughs> we're past our time. Anybody got any comments or questions on what we talked about today? No.